And welcome to another episode of Psychotherapy Networker Live. I'm Chris Lyford, and I'm the senior editor here at Psychotherapy Networker Magazine. Thank you so much for joining us for a very special discussion with John and Julie Gottman. John, Julie, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're really pleased to be here. Thanks for inviting us. Yeah, thanks, Chris. <clears throat> of course, of course. Now, Julie is the co-founder and president of the Gottman Institute, as well as the author of six books, the most recent of which we'll be discussing today. She's also the co-creator of the Art and Science of Love Weekend Workshops for Couples and the Gottman International Clinical Training Program. John is the co-founder of the Gottman Institute, as well as the author of hundreds of journal articles and 48 books. He's received numerous awards for his marriage and family research. Now, Time Magazine recently declared John and Julie the nation's leading marriage researchers and educators, and the New York Times called them the Dean of Marriage Experts. But of course, those accolades pale in comparison to the fact that they are also the recipients of the 2021 Psychotherapy Networker Lifetime Achievement Award. <laughs> yeah, I also want to mention that Julie was kind enough to speak with me for a piece I wrote for our Therapy Beat column in the July issue of Psychotherapy Networker, titled Therapy Card Decks, A Session in the Palm of Your Hand. In the piece, I write about taking John and Julie's card deck app for a little test drive. You can find the card deck app free to download on Apple's App Store, and I can say from personal experience, it is a great way to get to know your partner and yourself a little bit better. I also want to let everyone out there watching know that we're offering a special discount on Psychotherapy Networker Magazine. For a limited time, you can get a year-long subscription for just $12. So just follow the link at the bottom of the screen and enter the promo code GODMAN at checkout. So today, we'll be discussing John and Julie's latest book titled The Love Prescription, Seven Days to More Intimacy, Connection, and Joy, which is being released next Tuesday, September 27th. And John and Julie, I want to start by asking you this. So you've written a lot about the science of love and what makes or breaks a romantic relationship. So what's different about the love prescription and what makes it so timely? So what's different about the love prescription is that it gives couples a different level of hope. With each chapter, there is something small to do maybe 10 minutes, representing something new each day of seven days. So you're doing something that helps you connect with your partner, that deepens your appreciation of your partner. Uh, expressing fondness and admiration is a part of it. Talking about spirituality is a part of it. So there's just a small thing to do every single day and why it's important and how to do it that really can, uh, can help couples to see how a relationship can change even a little bit in seven days. And most people today um, are fed up with COVID, you know, things are still continuing on. People are still reprioritizing their life. They're continuing to look at their relationships. So it's an, it's an intense time of examination and contemplation of your own life, priorities, and values. And we're hoping that relationship is a big part of that. Thus, we're releasing the book now um, to really help in that process. Yeah, part of uh, the motivation for us writing this book was that in our Art and Science of Love workshop, which people can purchase on the Gottman Institute, uh, we found that only 3% of couples actually go through all of it. <laughs> and so we wanted to deal with the fact that, you know, it's hard to get started. And we wanted to have something that was more manageable, bite-sized pieces, stuff you could do in just a week just to get the ball rolling. Great. So tell me a little bit about uh, who this book is for and how can they use it? Um, this book is for anybody who is contemplating going into a relationship or has a relationship that uh, they want to enhance that is already good, already positive, mm -hmm. but here's some new things to make it even better, as well as couples who are distressed who are feeling quite distant from their partner and have no idea of where to begin to reconnect mm -hmm. with their partner. Um, 
so the the explanations for why different pieces of connection that we have seen in our research to work very well, why each of those is important, and then how to do them is really what the book is presenting. Great, great. Now, the subtitle of this book is Seven Days to More Intimacy, Connection, and Joy. So seven days may not seem like a lot of time, especially for couples who've spent months or even years in therapy. Can you really change your relationship in just one week? Well, I think so. You're not going to change your relationship for a lifetime, forever and ever, based on a week. However, you know, depending on the kind of therapy people have been in, they may not have been introduced to these particular ways of creating a positive connection. A lot of couples therapy focuses on conflict and how to resolve conflict, but it doesn't focus on the positive end, uh, all the positivity in the relationship. And as we know from John's research, in an average conversation that isn't conflict, the number of positive interactions to negative needs to be 20 to 1 mm-hmm. in order for the relationship to be successful. And during a conflict, there has to be five times as many positives as negative for that couple to really have some hope that things are going to go well in the future. So people don't know how to achieve or produce that positive, wonderful um feeling that they may have had years ago when they were dating or first married. So this is a way to establish new habits, new patterns of behavior that over time, if you practice them regularly after you're introduced to them in this first week, they can really make a difference in the relationship. Yeah, we change the trajectory of the relationship. And over time, that results in large changes. Fantastic. Now, the introduction of this book is titled Small Things Often. And you give a little preview of the book in in it. And you write, love is a practice. More than a feeling, it's an action. It's something you do, not something that just happens to you. And you need to give and get a daily dose to maintain a healthy, thriving relationship. So can you tell me a little bit more about the importance of doing small things often? Yeah. um, One of the things that we found in our apartment laboratory, when the cameras were just rolling and uh, people were just hanging out together, we weren't asking them to talk about anything in particular, where there were these small moments where one person would try to get their partner's attention, interest, Mm -hmm. have a conversation, tell a joke, (laughs) read something from the paper or talk about what they were watching on TV. And, and the other person, you know, could either turn toward that attempt to connect or not respond, turn away or respond irritably, you know, say something like, you know, stop interrupting me. I'm trying, I'm trying to read. <laughs> and what we found is six years later that uh, the couples who had divorced, the newlywed couples who divorced, uh, when we look back earlier, they had, turn toward these attempts to connect only 33% of the time. Whereas the people who were still married six years earlier had turned toward these bids 86% of the time. Yeah. So over a six year period, these small moments were predicting an enormous thing about the trajectory of the relationship. But not only that, they had big implications for how people acted when there was a conflict. So if they turned toward at a higher level, it turned out that they, they had access to small moments during conflict when they had a sense of humor about themselves, where they mm-hmm. were affectionate. And that reduced physiological arousal during conflict. So these very small moments done often really have implications for the entire relationship and how it, how it interacts during conflict, how it deals with conflict, but also how it creates intimacy. And these very small things turn out to actually be the secret of having a great sex life as well. Hmm. Great, great. Yeah, you're referring to bids for connection and turning toward, which in the book you call 
the number one relationship hack. So thank right. you. Thank you for, for sharing that with us. Um, in the book, you also ask readers to become a topographer, a love map creator. And there's a great little personal story you two share about a little island cabin. If you wouldn't mind, tell us a bit more about that. Our cabin. Our cabin? Yeah. So um, the story was that, um, you know, when we weren't married very long, um, you know, we were taking vacations on a spot north of Seattle called Orcas Island. We now live there full time. And uh, although we have a little place in Portland as well, since we became grandparents uh, in January of this year, we're shuttling back and forth between Portland and Orcas Island. But Julie wanted to get a small cabin on Orcas Island. And I was really opposed to it. We already had a house uh, in Seattle, and I thought it was extravagant to have that. And so we fought about that a lot. I was resistant. She was trying to explain to me why it was so important to her and why we could afford it. And, uh, and we finally decided to go to therapy. And we went to therapy with, uh, with you know, a really good therapist who liked me a lot more than she liked Julie. So I thought <laughs> Wait, she was a great therapist. I'm not so sure she was so good. <laughs> <laughs> talking about boundaries. Now, I needed to create boundaries in our relationship. I needed to say, no to Julie if I didn't agree with the cabin. Mm -hmm. And that was it. Julie would have to adopt to my boundaries. That's what was important in relationships. And I, I looked at Julie and I said, do I sound like her? And she said, yeah, you do. And I said, well, I don't want a relationship based on boundaries. I want, <laughs> I want to eliminate boundaries. So we fired the therapist and went home and <laughs> really talked to each other about, you know, why I was so resistant, why it was so important to her. And you know, we found that we had this island of connection about Orcas Island where, you know, I learned from Julie how important nature was to her and how important it was to her growing up. She could hear trees talking. To me, nature was, you know, you go to a park and have a picnic and then you wipe the nature off when you come indoors. <laughs> when I grew up in New York City. Nature right. was important to me, you know, and then as a refugee from the Holocaust, you know, my dad had always said, you know, don't invest in property because you may have to flee at some point. <laughs> you know, you're Jewish and you may have to flee. So I was resistant to, you know, getting a cabin. And once I understood my resistances uh, and why it was so important to Julie, we could both reach a compromise and try to get a small place and have it be an experiment in exchange for which Julie agreed to keep a kosher home. Uh, which was really very difficult in Seattle. But we did that as well. And as soon as, you know, I spent the summer in our own cabin, I just, I was sold. I thought it was just <laughs> wonderful. Yay. So uh, tying this together with love maps. Yes. So what love maps are, um, uh, love maps are your way to understand your partner's internal world. So what are your partner's values, needs, emotions about certain things, history, personal history, mm -hmm. ups and downs, feelings about politics and so on? And are you known by your partner? Mm -hmm. So, you know, the secret to love mapping is to ask each other questions. And those questions need to be not like, did you call the plumber? They need to be big, open-ended questions like, what's your dream for who our child will become 10 years mm -hmm. from now? So they need to be big questions that really draw on the partner's reflection deep down inside, and then that partner being vulnerable enough to share what they are feeling, thinking, experiencing, so that the two of you really have knowledge of each other. And it's important to continue to ask each other questions. We stop doing it after we date and get busy with kids, marriage, etc., all the things, the to-do list. But it's so important because we are evolving as human beings over time. Mm -hmm. And we have to keep up with the changes our partner is going through in their own experiences. So that's why love mapping is so important. Great, great. 
Yeah, I, I really love that story about the Little Island Cabin. I, I love how in the book, you're not afraid to turn the camera on yourselves. There are a lot of case studies that really bring these ideas to life. That's one of the things that I really loved about this book. Um, right. Good. In the book, you also call a positive perspective the most potent antidote there is. And like you said earlier, you write that it's quantifiable that you need roughly 20 times as much everyday positivity as there is negative negativity between you and your partner. So can you talk a bit more about why a positive perspective is so important? Yeah, um, you know, the positive perspective is really kind of like your overall cost benefit analysis of your partner and the relationship. And if you have a positive view, uh, which doesn't mean that you don't have negative feelings as well, but your overall positive view gives you a mindset where you give your partner the benefit of the doubt. If your partner is crabby or irritable or distant, you know, you're really saying to yourself, well, you know, she must not have slept very well or she's stressed out. You know, I'm thinking uh, I'll ask her about that. But, you know, I'm not going to take this personally. Whereas if you have a negative perspective, a negative overall cost benefit analysis, it's like you're walking around with a chip on your shoulder. You're ready, you know, to really think my partner is mean or selfish and nurse a grudge uh, in the relationship when your partner is grumpy and sort of withdraw and think, boy, you know, I'm putting up with a lot of junk in this relationship, you know, who needs this? And, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to go talk about my relationship to somebody else. I'm not going to talk to Julie about it. So that negative perspective really gets in the way of dealing with what you're really feeling in the relationship. And it's potentially harmful. Great. Um, one of my last questions, you mentioned author uh, Chrisana Northrup's work with sociologists Pepper Schwartz and James Witt, where they identified specific habits practiced by couples in happy, sexually fulfilling relationships. Could you share some of those specific habits with us? Yeah, let me, uh, let me uh, talk about that a little bit. Uh, <clears throat> so these people did the largest study on love and sex ever done, 70,000 people from 24 different countries. And that question was, what's different about people who say they have a great sex life and people who say they have a terrible sex life? And what amazed me was the answers everywhere on the planet didn't have anything to, to do with what happened in the bedroom. It, people who had a great sex life said, I love you every day and meant it. They kissed one another passionately for no reason at all. They gave compliments. They touched each other, expressed affection even in public. They cuddled. Only 4% of the non-cuddlers said they had a great sex life. 96% said it was terrible. So, you know, here were these things that had to do with affection and connection, having weekly romantic dates. And that was the secret to having a great sex life. And that, I thought that was just so breathtaking in its finding. Want to add to that, right? Mm, no, you covered it well. Okay. Yeah. Great, great. Um, what message do you have for all the therapists out there watching this? What do you want them to know, particularly those who are struggling with couples in their practice? And then what message do you have for the struggling couples? Okay. So a message for the struggling clinicians and a message for the struggling couples. Is that yes. right? <laughs> Correct. Yes. Okay. All right. So struggling clinicians, um, be a Buddhist. And what I mean by that is just focus on the here and now, what's happening between the partners and um, be sure to interrupt the four horsemen. I think clinicians have the hardest time with that. The four horsemen being criticism, contempt, defensiveness, and stonewalling. It also really, really helps to give partners the antidote when you see one of those four horsemen. So antidotes include things like making a repair, saying, oh, I said the wrong thing. I'm so sorry. Let me try again. Uh, also, um, trying to express some appreciation of what your partner is doing right, and ultimately describing yourself, not describing the partner, but describing yourself 
uh, and this is for couples as well as for clinicians. So clinicians help your couples to say what a partner feels about what, not about the personality flaw of the partner, which is criticism, and then um, articulate a positive need, express a positive need. And a positive need means how can the partner shine for the other partner? How can they shine for them? What can they do right? As opposed to telling them what they should stop doing because it's wrong. That doesn't go very far. So giving you know, it's okay for one partner to really um, coach the other in terms of what getting a need met would look like for the partner asking for that need uh, and being as concrete as possible. Then, you know, if the partner uh, then says, okay, I know what to do, I'll go do it. Um, the first partner shouldn't say, oh, you're just doing it because I told you to do it. Um, the answer to that is, yes, <laughs> I did tell you to do it. And that's the only way you're going to know what I need. <laughs> right. Um, so, you know, that's, that is, um, all part of both what clinicians need to help their couples do, um, focusing on what the partner is doing right. And then avoiding those four horsemen with giving them antidotes like, I feel about what and I need. It also can be very helpful uh, for the clinician to uh, use a pulse oximeter or even an app on your phone or their phone uh, to look at the heart rate of each person, especially when they're discussing a conflict. Because we found that stonewalling, which is our fourth big a horseman of the apocalypse is often related to somebody being flooded in fight or flight with a heart rate over 100 beats a minute. Mm -hmm. And if that is discovered in one of the partners by you're asking the partner to measure it, um, then you know why the other person who is flooded is stonewalling. They're going inside to soothe themselves. Mm -hmm. They're not trying to punish the other person. So explaining that to the couple can also be helpful. And couples can do that at home as well. Yeah, let me let me answer your question too. I, I think Julie did a good job there. But for the therapist, I, I would say that this book really talks more about solving the moment and helping mm -hmm. couples solve the moment to use Dan Wiles language. Mm -hmm. And he wrote a wonderful book called Solving the Moment before he died uh, during the pandemic. And, you know, if, if a couple can focus on the moment and how to make it better, then they learn so much. So the therapist can really help them do that. For couples, I would say that the great thing is that turning toward leads to more turning toward. Mm -hmm. And so it's a positive feedback loop which means that you can have low standards for turning toward. Wherever you start is good enough. Even just watching your partner and seeing how your partner asks for what he or she needs is a good start to turning toward. And it'll sweep you up like a river does, you know, with its current. Because turning toward just sweeps you up and increases turning toward. Only if appreciation is expressed, however, for that turning toward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So both people have a role. One person makes a bid, the other person hopefully returns toward and responds positively to that bid. Then the first person needs right then to express thank you, express appreciation. Only then will that cycle keep going and improve. Good point. I love it. John, Julie, thank you so much for everything. Mm -hmm. You are longtime friends of The Networker. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the book is excellent. I, I love the case examples. It's lively. It's fun. I learned a lot from it. Uh, I, I love the little exercises that are interspersed. Uh, the book is called The Love Prescription, Seven Days to More Intimacy, Connection, and Joy, which is being released next Tuesday, September 27th. John, Julie, thank you again. This has been really wonderful. 
Thank thanks so that. much, Chris. Yeah, thank you, Chris. And all of you clinicians listening to this, I want to thank you personally for really doing the work to bring a little more love into the world. Yeah. So thank you. Great. And with that, I, I want to remind everybody out there watching, uh, we do have a special discount on Psychotherapy Network or Magazine. Uh, just $12 for a full year of issues. When you follow the link at the bottom of the screen and enter promo code Gottman at checkout. Until next time, I'm Chris Lyford, the Psychotherapy Networker. See you again soon.